Welcome everyone to Science for Food Security, making a global, professional and personal difference. My name is Serena Locke and I've been a rural journalist for 30 years with the ABC and also the BBC. I've covered agriculture here and overseas, been to Indonesia, West Timor, East Timor, Timor-Leste, reporting on food security and Australia's agricultural aid programs as well. I'm now National Regional Planning Editor with the ABC. So we'll now have an acknowledgement of country before we get underway. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the land. So with this webinar, we want high school and university students and you and the general public to know about the impact of science and food and global, as global food security and nutrition security and the broad range of study, career and volunteering pathways to, to help you get on your way. My own connection to agricultural aid goes back about 30 years when my mother was an aid worker in West Timor. She was a veterinarian on the project to improve the livestock health and veterinary services on the eastern islands of Indonesia. So you think of Flores, Sumba, Sumbawa, West Timor. She was taking blood from cows, doing post-mortems on goats, instructing everyone to read the gizzards of goats in the village to see what the goats died from. But in particular, she had the most success developing a vaccination program for the village chickens. Now, 15 years later, I went back as an ABC journalist with the Crawford Fund on a trip, and I took mum with me to see what had happened to her project. And we found the villagers had developed a lot. They were still using vaccinations, but they would um, use them on not the village chickens, which were not very productive, but on layer chickens and on meat chickens. They had better coops, they had better feeding and better watering. So a lot of projects had combined with my mother's over the years to develop a higher standard of living. And the children were getting a better education. They weren't spending half their day carrying water and their standard of living had improved. Now, more recently, I reported on the, um, AB, for the ABC on Timor Leste's situation with assistance from the Crawford Fund. So where the coral reefs have been damaged by storms and human activity, the fish are declining. And Timor is an island, it's surrounded by water, but has very little fishing industry. And these women on a Toro Island that you can see have the job of diving deep down on the reefs with no particular equipment, just to spear the fish. They dry it, and as you see here, they sell it. But now in order to protect the reefs, a project backed by the organisation called World Fish has buoys that float on the ocean with ropes attached. And these ropes att attract the fish, fish aggregating devices. And the fishing women and men can go to those ropes knowing that there will be fish to, ta to take for their dinners. And it means the children get better feed, more nutrients, protein, iron, micronutrients. And the main outcome here is to tackle malnutrition because half of Timor Leste's children are malnourished, causes stunting, lacks, their ability to learn is impacted. So now let's meet our inspiring speakers. They are young agricultural scientists. They are Laura McFarlane Berry. She's a vet with the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment in Canberra. She works in the epidemiology and One Health section as a disease detective. Sam Coggins was a graduate officer at the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. And he's now working on digital tools for farmers in developing countries in a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation projects. And he's doing a PhD aiming to help alleviate climate risks for farmers abroad and at home in Australia. And Beck Cotton is the president of the Researchers in Agriculture for International Development Network, so it's RAID. It brings together young Australians with an interest in agriculture and international development, and she's using her degree in sustainability and improving agricultural extension. So we have some pre-submitted questions from our audience, but you're all invited to submit any other questions as they come up when you're hearing the talks. And uh, we have some viewers from overseas, so it'd be great to see those um, where you're from. So if you can submit your questions and tell us where you're from. You see a poll on your screen. Um, are you from a school? Which school? From a university? Or beaming in from overseas? Or just generally interested? 
So uh, respond to the poll and keep an eye on the comments for the results. But now I'll hand over to Laura. Thank you, Serena. Um, so I'm going to start today um, by talking about a photo that was taken a few years ago while I was an Australian volunteer in Bangladesh. In this photo, our team is about to take a boat to a village to investigate an outbreak of anthrax in people and in livestock. Today, I'm really excited to share with you the story of how I ended up on this boat in Bangladesh and what I've been working on since then. When I was in year nine, I remember looking down a list of careers to choose from and seeing the word veterinarian. And most people think veterinarians work in clinics and usually treat cats and dogs, perhaps some farm animals. That's, that's kind of what I thought a veterinarian would do. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. Um, if you go to the next slide. Around the same time, a person came to speak uh, at my school about, uh, about her journey of starting a volunteer organization to help children attend school in low-income countries. I knew that once I had some useful skills, I wanted to volunteer overseas too. So after a lot of hard work in school, I started studying veterinary science and was on the path to my dream job, or so I thought. Once I started the degree, I realized that being a dog and cat vet was definitely not for me. I wanted to make a difference to the lives of millions of animals, particularly farm animals like cows, sheep, uh, chickens and pigs. I wanted to support farmers and livestock industries, and I wanted to reduce the risk of animal diseases infecting people. I wanted to be a veterinary epidemiologist. Now, given the current COVID-19 pandemic, you may have already heard of epidemiologists. Epidemiologists are like disease detectives because we try and find out what's causing a disease and then use our knowledge to control or prevent it happening in the first place. I had no idea how to become a veterinary epidemiologist. So I asked one of my uni professors for help in finding some work experience and I've never looked back. My first professional job was in the Victorian uh, veterinary, uh, Chief Veterinary Officers Unit. Um, there I was involved in managing and analyzing disease data, investigating outbreaks, and in science communication. But after a few years of working in Victoria, I felt that I had enough experience to be able to contribute to animal health overseas. So I got in touch again with my former uni professor, and he told me all about the Australian Volunteer Program. Each year, the Australian government supports over a thousand skilled Australians to volunteer in developing countries overseas, mostly in Asia and the Pacific. People can volunteer at uh, different stages of their career and they come from a variety of professions. Agriculture is an important skill area because in many developing countries, agriculture is a large part of the economy. And through agriculture, people can lift themselves out of poverty and produce enough food to eat for themselves and for their families. So that's how I ended up in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a small country, uh, five times smaller than New South Wales. I've put a little map on the screen. Um, it's sandwiched between India and Myanmar. Um, and despite its size, it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world with over 160 million people. That's more than six times the population of Australia. There are around 24 million cows, 26 million goats, and over 300 million uh, ducks and chickens. Malnutrition uh, is a lot better than it was a few years ago, but it's still a major problem and improving agriculture can help. My volunteer assignment was with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and I worked inside a Bangladeshi government office building. With the UN, I helped design surveillance systems to look for bird flu and other diseases in animals which could make them sick or die, or could potentially result in human pandemics. I worked on projects to improve food safety. I designed training for people so that they could investigate outbreaks better. Um, on the previous slide, there were some pictures of some pigs um, that uh, I took while designing a project to look for uh, flu viruses. 
Um, pigs are only consumed by minority communities in Bangladesh as the country is mostly Muslim and doesn't eat pork. And this meant I needed to travel to all different parts of the country to meet pig owners. I went to poor Hindu communities and cities. I met with wealthy uh, nomadic pig owners and I went to small Buddhist communities. In the last place I visited, my colleagues described the pig owners to me as we walked up to the farms. He said, in the community, the people would buy pigs and grow them through the year and then kill them in a special ritual one day per year. I never heard of a pig killing ritual before, so I asked if the day was approaching. Yes, he said, it's December 25. They call it Christmas. I actually think I gained as much professionally from the experience um, as what I contributed. While my colleagues in Bangladesh lack some technical training, they have experience with diseases um, that we just don't have in Australia. They also have some great ideas about how animal and public health could work together to reduce the risk of zoonotic diseases, that is animals, uh, diseases which infect people. In Bangladesh, I also learned about an on-the-job training program to train, veterinarian, uh, to train veterinary epidemiologists, which was run by the Thai government in support of the U, uh, with the support of the UN. This training approach, I believe, would greatly benefit Australia, and I was actually awarded a Churchill Fellowship last year to travel overseas and investigate the idea further. Unfortunately, a certain zoonotic disease called COVID has put a stop to overseas travel for the time being. But being an Australian volunteer is more than just work. I went to Bangladesh with a group of other Australians and met many more locals while I was in country. Many of the people I volunteered with or met in Bangladesh remain my friends today. Also living in Bangladesh and immersing myself in the culture gave me a completely new way of thinking um, about the world and worked out, it helped me work out what was really important to me. And of course, Bangladeshis have big weddings and I was invited to, to a lot of them. Another thing I enjoyed a lot was that because of where Bangladesh is located, I was able to travel to other countries like India, Nepal, Myanmar and Singapore on my breaks. In fact, I had such an amazing time volunteering in Bangladesh, I decided to extend my stay and volunteered for a public health organization called ICDDRB in zoonotic research. And it was with ICDDRB that I found myself on that boat that I showed you in that very first slide. People in several villages had developed a mark on their skin and their doctor thought it may be anthrax. Anthrax is a serious disease caused by a bacteria and it occurs sometimes in livestock in Australia and in Bangladesh and it can also infect people. In Australia, when we have an anthrax outbreak, it is really rare for humans to become infected. But unfortunately in Bangladesh, human infections are more common. This is because people will kill and eat sick animals as they're dying because they cannot afford to waste food. Untreated anthrax can be fatal in people. To investigate the village reports, the government and the research organization formed a team of vets, doctors and public health experts, and I was invited along. No road existed to get to one of the villages, so we traveled by boat. The disease investigation team made sure that all the infected people were treated with antibiotics. And we also identified some new ways the villagers could reduce their risk that their animals would get anthrax so that they wouldn't need to eat contaminated meat in the future. After one and a half years in Bangladesh, I returned to Australia, but I've subsequently worked as an epidemiologist uh, with the UN on similar projects in Vietnam and in Myanmar. Um, next slide. And these are just some of those pictures from my time overseas. At the moment, I'm based in Canberra with the Australian Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. My work here is similar, but with fewer disease outbreaks and much more funding. There are so many great things about working in agriculture. You can come from the country or the city. You can study many different things. I've worked with laboratory scientists, economists, anthropologists, ecologists and wildlife experts. You can work in a great range of jobs work at a local level with farmers directly right through to a national level with government or in the private sector. And you can work across Australia or overseas. Volunteering overseas is also a once in a lifetime experience that I recommend to you all. 
And now I'm handing over to Sam. Thanks, hey, Steve, Laura, and g'day, everybody. My name's Sam. I'm 24 years old and I'm from Canberra. Uh, just like Laura and Beck and Serena, I love agriculture for international development. Uh, agriculture for international development is a fancy term for improving the world through agriculture. Uh, today, I want to explain why I love it so much and then also why I think it's a great career choice and a meaningful career path for young people in Australia and other countries as well. To do this, I want to tell you about this place in Sri Lanka. It's a student dormitory that I live with my three Sri Lankan friends for, for six months as part of my university degree in Australia. Um, on one of the weekends when I was in Sri Lanka, I went for a bushwalk with a German guy. And this German guy told me this story about when he was traveling in China. He got a chairlift to the top of this Chinese mountain and the people that he shared the chairlift with took it in turns to stand on top of the mountain and pump their fists in the air and scream for the camera. And I found it such a funny story because these guys were pretending to the world and to Instagram and to themselves that they'd conquered this mountain when they just got on a chairlift. Anyway, I then went back from my relaxing weekend away back to my student dormitory with my three Sri Lankan friends. And they were, there they were, like every weekend, studying for an English exam. They were studying for this English exam so they could have a chance at applying for a scholarship to go to an Australian university. Thinking about this more, I realised that my whole life has been one big chairlift. I was born in one of the richest countries in the world. English was my first language. I was given a loving family, excellent education opportunities, excellent nutrition. These are quite normal opportunities for a lot of people in Australia, but is, this is far from normal for most of the world's population, as I found out in Sri Lanka. My mates in Sri Lanka were busting your gut every weekend to just have a chance at accessing some of the opportunities that I was given by default because of where I was born. I find this unfairness really confronting, not just at an individual level, but then also at a big picture level. Um, every day, Today or today, there's 820 million people that don't have enough food to eat, let alone nutritious food. I struggle to get my head around that number. That's 30 Australia's worth of people that tonight won't have enough dinner on the plate um, to eat. So thinking about this as I sit here with my expensive headphones in this nice house, eating whatever food I want and as how much as I want, I'm constantly reminded of how unfair the world is. And it brings up this question in my mind that I'm always thinking about and I don't know the answer to it and I hope we can think about it together. If we, the young people of Australia, don't take meaningful actions against poverty, hunger, climate change, then are we in part responsible or to blame for the human suffering and the unfairness that these awful problems create? If your answer to this question is a maybe or a tentative yes, then the next question becomes, well, what are the meaningful actions that we and yet as young people can take against these really big problems? I was at a loss for this for a long time and I was clutching at straws and it made me feel really sad until I learned about agriculture for international development. I learned that most poor people in the world are farmers, most hungry people in the world are farmers and farmers produce just about all of the food that you and I eat every day. So in the words of Bill Gates, it's been proven that of all interventions to reduce poverty, improving agriculture productivity is the best. I love agriculture for development because it enables us to work with people to build chairlifts with people that may not have one. Um, so that is why I love agriculture for international development. And then what does a job in this field look like? Well, for me, I spend my days working with rice scientists and rice farmers in Myanmar one of the countries quite close to Bangladesh that um, Laura talked about. We're working with farmers and scientists on digital tools to improve farming practices in Myanmar. Specifically, we're developing infographics and videos to help rice scientists and rice farmers share their knowledge with each other using their smartphones. Um, so the ultimate goal of this work is to help rice farmers improve their yields, improve their livelihoods to send their kids to school, and then also reduce the environmental impacts of their rice farming. 
So on an average day, I might have a call with rice scientists in the morning about the content of our videos or the smart or the infographics. Um, in the middle of the day, we might have a, a Facebook video call with one of the farmers that we're working with in Myanmar, and they'll tell us that oh, the, the video is too long. It's, it's not practical for farmers to watch this when they have to pay for the mobile um, network access. And then in the afternoon, I might have a call with one of our business mentors on how we can provide this service with farmers more sustainably and, and more scalably. So every day I get to contribute to stuff that I really believe in. Every day I get to learn and do something different, whether that's learning about rice science, about Myanmar language, about farmer psychology, about software development, business design, practicalities of rice farming. That's the variety within my job alone. But as Laura said in her presentation, there's never ending variety across jobs in agriculture, international development. I have friends working in agriculture for international development that have studied anthropology or mechatronic engineering, drone technology, economics, software development, other forms of social sciences. The, the list really never ends. It's not about making agriculture your passion or your interest. It's about making your interests and your skills fit agriculture for international development. Apart from having a tangible skill set to be able to contribute, the other crucial thing you need to work in agriculture for international development is international experience on the ground with farmers. And I always found it really annoying when people would tell me this because how, how am I supposed to get international experience if I don't have any international experience? Um, but fortunately for young Australians, there are uh, formal structured opportunities that you can access to get those experiences. So that includes the New Colombo Plan Scholarship and Mobility Programs, Australian Volunteers for International Development that Laura spoke about, the Graduate Program of the Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research. ACI is um, one of the government's leading organisations that provides agriculture aid with developing countries. Engineers Without Borders Australia and Researchers in Agriculture for International Development. They have you can join RAID as a for free on the website or join the Facebook group to be able to access um, the latest opportunities that people post regularly. And then of course, there's the Crawford Fund that provides conference awards and student awards to help um, young Australians get experience overseas with farmers. So while we're on this slide, I really wanna emphasize, if we just go back to that slide, those are the, the structured opportunities. Um, but there are so many more unstructured, informal opportunities, internships, research opportunities, job opportunities that you won't find on websites. And the only way to access these informal opportunities is to be, uh, to be connected with people that know about them. And so this means talking with lecturers after class, lecturers that you find interesting, um, sending people emails, going to conferences and talking with people, following the RAID Facebook group, um, I know it feels squeamish at times, particularly for introverted people like me, um, but there's three pieces of good news with this networking. One is that the more you do it, the better you get at it. Number two is that people in agriculture for international development are so keen to support young people that want to get into it. Um, so people really want to help you if you reach out to them. And then the third piece of good news is that Really the worst thing that can happen if you try and send an email to somebody or talk to somebody after class is that they won't have time to reply to your email or won't have time to talk with you. And if that's the worst thing that can happen, then really there's no harm in having a crack. So to sum it all up, the world is a very unfair place. Um, agriculture for international development is a practical and effective way for young people to, to build showers for people that may not have one. And there is a massive variety of jobs within agriculture for international development and a massive variety of pathways to get into it. So I'll now keenly pass over to Beck. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Laura, for your interesting presentations. And good morning to all of you. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting to you all virtually during National Science Week. As Serena mentioned, um, I'm from the, NAID, the RAID Network, or Researchers in Agriculture for International Development. But I'll tell you a bit more about that later on. Now, the majority of my work over the past few years has been in the people space of agriculture, in particular, agricultural extension. 
who would have thought there's space for social science um, between testing soils and raising cattle? Just the previous slide, thank you. My presentation today is on making your passion your career. And in my case, as well as the others who have spoken previously in the international agricultural field. Now, there will be a mixture of you out there, some who are dead set on what you want to do straight after school, and some who have no blooming idea. If you had asked me as a child growing up in a rural farming area, would I be interested in a career in agriculture? I would have laughed at you. So what does my journey look like? My university journey started in a biomedical science degree, which intrinsically didn't suit me and left me felt feeling underwhelmed. So I decided to make a change. With a few years of experience from my first degree under my belt, I made the informed decision to change courses and begin studying a Bachelor of Science majoring in sustainability at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And I loved it. It was soon into this change, I also discovered that pure desk work wasn't satisfying all of my ambitions. Although at this stage, I still wasn't sure what kind of career I could build in this space. Next slide. This is where I had my first taste at international research. With the help of the university, I spent almost 12 months working on a variety of research projects and working as a farm hand on a pollinator's farm. As you can see in my pictures, I was fully immersed in nature, quite different to the Australian environment. And I got to take part in a variety of research projects, everything from looking at grizzly bear hibernation to bee pollination patterns. Now through these experiences, I discovered two things. The first was that I loved research in the international space and I wanted to do more of it. And two, I really did love agriculture. It's something we all need. It has the ability to bring together communities no matter what corner of the world you're from. Next slide. So I graduated from my degree and decided to continue following this new discovered passion and enrolled in an honors degree looking at organic agriculture in the South Pacific Islands. My project was centered around how farmers in Fiji and the Cook Islands prefer to gain information in particularly around organic certification. This saw me spending three months in the islands, learning, working, and understanding how Pacific Island peoples um, farm and exchange knowledge, or in other words, agricultural extension. So a bit of homework for you all out there is to jump onto Google Earth and check out the Cook Islands. As you can see, again from my pictures, one of the benefits of working in this international ag space is that it brings you to some of the world's most beautiful locations. I definitely wasn't complaining spending so much time in the islands. Now during that year, I was lucky enough to win a Crawford Fund scholarship to attend the annual conference in Canberra. This is where I got to connect with hundreds of others who shared the same passion as I. I then came to the realization that this passion can also be my job. Through the connections I made at both university and the opportunities such as the Crawford Fund Conference, I lined up a graduate experience at the Australian Centre for International Agriculture. Next slide. Which is where I met Sam who spoke just before me. Now ACIA is an organisation that identifies opportunities and partnerships to undertake international agricultural research through collaborations with partnering countries. Throughout my time at ACR, I was involved in a variety of research projects based all around the world and experienced firsthand the magnitude and good that the international agricultural sector is doing for the world. I was fortunate enough to meet with farmers and travel to places such as India, Nepal, Philippines, Cambodia, Indonesia, just to name a few. I'll direct your attention to the middle left hand side of my screen, I hope that's, that's right. Um, on a project review in Papua New Guinea, um, I stumbled across a group of men dressed quite uniquely. Um, there were, these group of men um, were dressed in ceremonial costumes. They're also known as the gallop nut men, which is a native nut only found in Papua New Guinea. 
They were emerging from the jungle, having spent two days in customonial celebrations. Now, this is just one small example of some of the unique and interesting experiences and sites that you may be privileged to witness when you're traveling to some pretty remote locations to visit agricultural plots around the world. Experiences such as these reiterated that I had found my career path. Now, the final experience I'll share with you, which leads me to where I'm sitting now. The next slide, please. Um, and that is with my journey with RAID. Now, I have been involved with RAID since my time as an undergraduate, where I would simply turn up to events to steal a free sausage and to talk to others who shared a similar passion. Somehow, six years later, I have wound up as their president. Now, researchers in agriculture for international development, or RAID, is an Australian-based network bringing together early to mid-career researchers with an interest in agriculture and international development. RAID is constantly looking for new ways to provide its members with opportunities to connect, engage and support people with a passion for international ag. One example is a new volunteers program for RAID members to spend time in Vietnam at the University, uh, the Vietnam National National University of Agriculture to work closely with students at a similar stage of their career. This opportunity has been set up in conjunction with the Australian Volunteers International and ACR. As Sam mentioned, I'd encourage you to check out the RAID website and to join our Facebook groups. You can read more um, from others um, on their stories and experiences like you've heard from myself today. You can find out about the different opportunities on offer again such as the formal and informal um, opportunities that Sam mentioned. Or you can just jump on to connect with like-minded people. And um, there's already something happening. Every Friday we do have a social happy hour um, where we sort of come together. We either have a cuppa or a beer and sort of tell each other what, about what we've been working on that week. So um, if you jump on the website, you can find out when the next one's happening and hopefully I'll see you there. In summary, if you have a passion, follow it. And don't be concerned if you don't know what that passion is right now, if it's not apparent. Trust me, it will come. Also, think about the different careers you can forge in agriculture. It can take you all over the globe. You can meet some diverse and interesting people whilst making a significant difference to global food security. Thank you for listening and I'll hand back over to you, Serena. Thank you so much, Beck, Sam and Laura. And um, what really inspiring talks about their individual experiences, but also the opportunities that are left to share, I suppose, and how much fun they're all having. I think that came through really distinctly about, you know, this isn't just about hard work. It's about the friends you make along the way and the difference that you can make to the developing world and also back home. So I'd encourage everyone watching to submit your questions now and we'll take those. But there have been some um, pre-submitted questions, so we'll, we'll go to a few of those. So let's, let's start with a fun question. Um, Sam, what's your funniest experience while working overseas? Uh, a tough one. Um, yeah, just one comes to mind when we were in Sri Lanka um, studying at university. There was a bus going around some veggie farms around a university field trip to learn about vegetable production in Sri Lanka. Um, and in Sri Lanka, they love singing and they love spicy food, which is an awful combination for me because I'm awful at eating spicy food and I'm also awful at singing. And so they were singing on the bus, singing all these Sri Lankan songs, and I was trying to trying to stay low to avoid having to sing this song. But, um, and they ended up finding me and getting me to stand up and sing a song from Australia. And I, I really couldn't think of anything, so I just sang um, the first few words of "Give Me a Home Among the Gum Trees." And yeah, the the they, um, my uni mates thought it was pretty funny and they didn't make me sing for too long. They said, okay, that's quite enough, Sam, sit down. <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah. That's one of the great benefits is, um, yeah, being able to go overseas and make real friendships with people from very different places of your own. And, um, yeah, that's, that was so unexpected for me to make really, really strong friendships with people that um, have different places. Mm. So, Laura, um, maybe you can tell us a funny experience, but also there is a question that's come in for you. So, from Dave Gale. 
How does your experience overseas help you with your current job with the Department of Agriculture and Water? Um, I think the you know some of the funniest experiences I, I mentioned in my my presentation. So so definitely finding out. Uh, about a special pig slaughtering ceremony at Christmas uh, really, really did make me laugh. Um, regarding how my experience overseas helps me in my current job for the Australian Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, um, look, even though the way that farming is done in Australia is just so different to the way it's done in Bangladesh, um, in Vietnam, in some of the countries I've worked in, um, I would say there's as many similarities as differences, um, particularly in, in some of these countries where, um, you know, in Bangladesh where, where there's so many people and so many animals, um, there really are, you know, a lot of issues with these diseases that move from animals to people and, and vice versa. Um, and so we can learn a lot from you know, people that work in different fields and, and I learned really how to work together and how to bring in social science um, and economics um, to some, some of the work that I was doing and, and also learn some new techniques from, from public health as well. Um, I think the way that they're training veterinary epidemiologists or animal disease detectives in, in these countries is really quite um, innovative. It's, it's based on a public health program that's been around for a really long time. Um, but, uh, you know, training people on the job, um, how, how to do these things means that they know how to respond when, when, an, um, when an outbreak its animals, um, that they have the effective skills to do this. And you know, I think Australia could, you know, really benefit from, from one of these programs. Yeah. Um, Beck, maybe that's a good question for you as well. How is what you've learnt overseas benefiting the work that you do now? A large part of my role at RAID is to engage with a variety of persons in a variety of disciplines. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a social scientist, so um, I don't know a whole of a lot about um, soil testing or about you know, engaging with cattle, but having worked overseas um, and having such diverse experiences, it's allowed me to really relate to some of the people that I have been working with. Even starting in a biomedical science degree, which although wasn't my calling, gave me the fundamental skills to relate to some of the biophysical um, projects and, and um, tasks that I'm involved with now. I wonder, um, Laura, you, you know, animals live so closely together, as you described, you know, and you showed pictures of those pigs living alongside the chickens. Um, perhaps you can flesh that out a bit more for us. What are the risks really to human health from all of that really close living, the animals together and then with the humans? That's a really great question, Serena. Um, when animals and, and people live so closely together, it means that you share an environment and you also can share diseases as well, unfortunately. Um, the disease that I worked on a lot was, was bird flu or influenza. Um, and that's a disease which you know, could potentially result in a, in a pandemic in people. Um, at the moment uh, when people are infected with, with some types of bird flu, they can become very sick and they can die. Um, and it's only through that direct contact with, with animals or with birds at the moment. Um, but there is the possibility that, that the disease could evolve and change. And that's what happens when um, birds and, and pigs and, and people are all living so closely together. The, the, the pig flus can mix with the bird flus and mix with the human flus. And then we can see something you know, new emerging that, that humans have um, not developed a, a, an immune response for. And, and we would unfortunately see something like we're seeing today with, with COVID. I think what we're hearing is that, you know, a lot of this work has inspired you, but do you feel like you are really making a difference? Can you see that while you're there? Or does it take a long time to see those results? Um, that's, that's also a really great question. Um, I think 
there are things that you can see results fairly quickly. Um, just uh, simple projects to improve the way that farmers look at biosecurity. So some better sheds on farms. Um, and they can see those, the profits from having that better biosecurity fairly quickly. Um, when, uh, when a farmer has um, some good housing to protect their chickens from wild birds, then they'll see less outbreaks. Um, they'll uh, see uh, healthier animals and, and they'll make um, more income and uh, have more uh, uh, nutrition to feed their family. Mm. Some things um, take a lot longer. And I think, you know, unfortunately for, for this space, there, there are a lot of um, changes that are happening in the world today. And, and it's very complex um, with uh, populations rising, um, with livestock populations rising to feed the feed all of the people. Um, we're building in areas that we've never built in before. And so we're going to see these increasingly kind of complex disease issues. Still much work to be done. Sam, if you can answer that question, do you see immediate results? I'd say, Laura, as well, sometimes, sometimes there's immediate stuff and then the bigger stuff is usually longer term. So I guess one example we can talk to in Myanmar is we're working with rice farmers on fertiliser timing. When farmers put fertilizer on their rice too early, the rice plant can't use it and suck it up into the plant. And so instead it gets sucked up into the atmosphere and has a really non-trivial impact on climate change. Rice farming um, contributes more emissions than the whole global aviation industry, not just during COVID, but in normal times as well. Um, so we've been working on trials with farmers so they can try putting fertilizer out a bit later on their farm. And one of the farmers in particular in our trials, he tried it on part of his farm and got a much bigger yield for his crop, or not, not much bigger, but a, a bit that was meaningful for him increase. And he talked about how it didn't benefit him. It was really beneficial for his community that this, this um, different practice um, can yeah, improve rice yields, improve livelihoods. Because it's a tough time being a rice farmer. You get paid twice a year sometimes. And um, so, yeah, he was really wrapped with that. And that was a really exciting day. But I must say in most of the work you um, a lot of the stuff you really bust the gut and there's limited benefits or the benefits are long term. So um, you really take the wins when they're there. And, but yeah, most of the work that you're contributing to is, is a long term thing. Um, Beck, maybe, yeah, no, go ahead. Go right ahead. I was just going to add to that is one of the benefits of working in this industry is that um, you often get to revisit and reconnect and rework um, in, in areas um, around the world. Um, I definitely began my career in the international space, more in the South Pacific, didn't go back for four or five years, went back again, and I could then see some of the longer term benefits of some of that um, initial research or initial sort of engagement. Um, so although you don't always get to reap those like initial rewards, you often get to see them longer term, which is fantastic. What support is there for volunteers who are embarking on this? Do you get paid as a volunteer? It sounds a silly question, but it's a, yeah, it's a good question. I'm happy to have a crack at that one. I mean, I haven't been a volunteer myself. I know you have Laura, so perhaps you can um, elaborate on anything that I miss. Um, but most definitely um, with the volunteer program that Ray is setting up at the moment, um, there is financial support. So although you may not be um, making enough to save, your general living expenses are covered. Um, and it's always reflected um, the amount that, that you receive as to where you're working. Um, so quite often you live a very comfortable lifestyle um, where you still have a bit of money to, to sort of try the experiences of the area um, whilst living comfortably um, and able to get your work done. Um, you're never out of pocket if you do these kind of experiences. And there are always top up um, grants and scholarships, many of which Sam mentioned in his slides. Um, and again, jump onto the Crawford or the RAID website because they're all listed up there. But Laura, perhaps you being a volunteer have some insight on that. Yeah, I think the support offered by the Australian government was really incredible. They um, gave us a pre-departure briefing where we got to meet other people that were traveling to our country and also meet people traveling to all different countries and learn about the exciting work 
they were going to do as well. Once I arrived in um, Bangladesh, they, they organized my flights uh, to get there and they made sure actually that all 10 of us were on um, the same flight uh, from Malaysia um, into Bangladesh. And so we, we all arrived together. We all, we all kind of had that first experience entering the country together. Um, and then we were taken to a hotel and had two weeks where we got to learn about the culture and the people and they helped us find somewhere to stay. Uh, they gave us some tips on uh, even simple things like buying groceries because, you know, in Bangladesh, there is no price for anything. You have to bargain for everything. Um, so what to wear um, and what we could expect when we met local families. Um, and that support was really incredible. We also met up with the group um, every sort of few months just to check in and see how everybody was going and um, have that opportunity to ask some more questions as well. So in addition to those allowances, we had all of that extra support as well, which was incredible. I mean, one of my favorite experiences was actually coming back to Australia and having the, the debriefing. And I met the most uh, incredible people and I learned about all of their experiences that they'd had in, in different countries doing projects you know, very different to mine. And it was just so inspiring to hear about what they'd been working on as well. It does sound like you were prompted then to go on to the next project and to the next project. So absolutely yeah, hungry for more. Were you living on dirt floors? Or, you know, were you eating food that you were worried about? Did you get sick yourself? You know, <laughs> that, that's a good question. Um, in Bangladesh, uh, accommodation was quite luxurious. We all had, um, on suites uh, in quite luxury apartment buildings. I don't think it's the same in every country. Um, so certainly speaking to people who are in Cambodia and Laos is a little bit more of a local experience. Um, the food, I, try, I tried a lot. Um, unfortunately, um, there are, you know, as I'm working on some food safety issues, there's definitely some food safety issues in Bangladesh as well, but um, taking some precautions like um, eating hot food or boiling your water um, is usually enough to, to avoid the worst. We could move on to a, to a question of, of technical nature. Sam, uh, you're working on a, a digital app. So maybe you can tell us um, that role of the mobile phone, of digital technology, of interconnectivity that is now. So, so many more career opportunities are there? Uh, yeah, it's a really exciting thing where the farmers that we're working with in Myanmar, there's, um, there's one, one government agronomist, like a farmer consultant for every 500 farmers. And there's rarely enough government funding to put fuel in the motorbike of the government agronomist. And so most of the farmers we've interacted with have rarely, rarely interacted with the government agronomist. And when they have, they haven't been satisfied with the experience. It's been like once or twice a year or something. Um, but the really exciting news and something that a lot of the farmers are excited about is that most of them have acquired their very own smartphone. More than 80% of farmers in Myanmar have their own smartphone. They get really cheap ones from China. Um, and then also while that's happening, the mobile network access in a lot of parts of um, Asia uh, is even better than rural Australia. Um, and so that's, that's opening up enormous opportunities for farmers to be able to access information, be able to access markets for their produce, access financial services like loans and savings accounts and insurance. And so, yeah, it's creating a world of possibilities and then also opportunities for people who want to build these services with farmers. Um, but at the same time, it's not a technology driven thing. What Beck talked about how it's not just about the technical science and epidemiology and software, it's also the human side of it. So we were quite naive when we first went to Myanmar, we were building this sophisticated app where you could take a photo of your rice leaf and then it'll tell you how much fertilizer you need to apply to the crop and we put so much work into the software and into the algorithm and it took so long and then the minute we showed it to a farmer to get their feedback on it they said this is useless for one thing there's a lot of things that can turn a rice yellow for another thing I can't take this phone to my farm I'll drop it in the water it's like my most valuable possession what do you want me to do and then the, the other thing was like, don't tell me how much fertilizer I need to use. I know I have to use more. I can't afford to use more. Um, and so we're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so then that was the lesson is that the technology creates a lot of opportunities, but then it has to be built with farmers on the ground to really make sure it, it fits with their priorities, their needs, their constraints and their opportunities. Beck, technology, 
that sort of idea about the leaps and bounds that people can make? It's a very exciting space. Um, it's not something that I've engaged with, although I do work in the ag extension field. Um, I very much look to people like Sam for the latest updates of what's happening with digital extension. But I do remember when I was interviewing farmers um, in Tavuni, which is known as the Garden Island of Fiji, um, and we were asking them, you know, how do you receive information? Um, and it would either be from my neighbour, from my cousin, from my grandpa, um, you know, rattling off a list of localised information, um, which is a very closed circle, um, which, is, which is great, but it doesn't always allow for new information streams to come in. Um, we also asked the farmers, if you could, where would you receive information? Um, and they said everywhere. They said they'd love to be connected through technology. Um, that they quite often are using their children's phones. Um, I don't think they were smartphones. I think they might have been those Nokia phones with the snake on it um, when I was there. But um, even, you know, six or seven years ago, there was this demand for more technological-based information systems. Um, so it's really encouraging to see that that's been taken up um, more globally. And there are some really innovative innovative research happening with people like Sam. So can't wait to see what it, you know, what happens in the future of digital extension. Perhaps um, a nice final question would be, what would you tell your younger self? If you're thinking about getting involved in international agriculture development, Beck, you first. Um, I'd simply say work hard um, and take opportunities. That definitely doesn't go unnoticed. Um, I'm similar to Sam and that a lot of opportunities have arisen through connecting with great mentors, person, uh, people in a similar career, going to conferences and workshops. And just by putting myself out there, um, putting my hand up for different opportunities, I've had many doors open. So don't be scared to try something new. Um, it often leads in some kind of lesson learnt. Laura? What do you tell your younger self? Great question. I think I would tell my younger self, definitely you have the right idea to go overseas and, and volunteer. I've had such an amazing experience. And so for everyone watching, it's something I strongly, strongly recommend that, that you give, a sh give it a go. Um, the, the programs that the Australian government have to, to support people are incredible. Um, and there are so many people that are willing to help if you have the enthusiasm. I, I would say just don't worry if you're from the city. I'm from the city and I was anxious that agriculture wouldn't accept me because I didn't grow up on a farm, but nobody cares. If you're keen to learn, um, agriculture will embrace you with open arms. Well, fantastic, inspiring, kind of, you know, so much more could be discussed. We could hear about, you know, what would be the next step. But I think if you want to know what the next step is, then um, go on to these websites that you'll see appearing on our screen. But I'd, I'd just like to thank the panel of speakers, Sam, Beck and Laura. Marvellous talks really inspiring and I think there's so much work still to be done you know you may think that it's all they've done it all but there is still so much to be done so if you want to get involved you can go on to the Crawford Fund website uh, you can join researchers in agriculture for international development we know what that is now thank you Beck the Crawford Fund's ACT student awards for travel are open for after COVID um, those interested in volunteering should also check the Government's Australian Volunteer Program, the website there. And there will be a survey for National Science Week and we encourage you to complete that so that we can um, make sure we get this right every time. And video recordings will be available uh, from the Crawford website so that you can review it or perhaps encourage any of your friends who you know may have missed but are looking for an opportunity of what to do next. So thank our speakers, uh, the, so Beck, Laura and Sam, thank you very much, the Crawford Fund, RAID and ACR. This initiative has been uh, supported by Inspiring Australia as part of National Science Week. Thank you. Thank you.